Hello everybody, Michael here for Tactic Imperialis. Welcome to today's video. Today is going to be another series of codex analysis and today we're going to be looking at another imperial codex, Codex Skitari. I'm almost tempted not to call this a codex, but well, it is officially a codex. It's kind of like Militar and Tempestus for the Imperial Guard. There's not many units, um, but there's a lot of formations and it feeds well into supplementing a full-on Mechanicus army. Speaking of which, we are going to do a Cult Mechanicus Codex review on the back of this one. Um, so if you are thinking of getting a full-on Omnissiah based force, then you can use this series to base your Skitari army and then use the next one for your Mechanicus. So how this series is going to go is slightly different to my regular series of Codex Nazis. The first episode we're going to do special rules, warlord traits, relics, uh, and the detachment as we always do. There's no psychic discipline in this Codex. Uh, the next episode we're going to do all the units. Uh, from my math, there's only... they're all formations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven units in this codex. So we're going to review them all in one big episode. And then we're going to do the last episode on the formations. Then we'll get our final thoughts. And then we'll move on and do the Mechanicus. And maybe we'll revisit talking about the Skitari after we've looked at how they go with Mechanicus. So as I said, today's episode, Warlord Traits, Relics, Special Rules, and Detachment. Let's start with Special Rules. So... The main thing for Skitari is the Doctrina Imperative. This is kind of the defining feature of the Skitari. It allows them to augment their abilities, sometimes at the cost of other things, though. So at the start of your movement phase, you can choose up to one Doctrina Imperative from the list. There are six in total. Protector Imperatives increase your shooting ability, while Conqueror Imperatives will make you better in the assault phase. Unless stated, each Imperative can only be used once per game. There are six I mentioned, so there is going to be at least one turn, where you, uh, will be one turn in a full length game where you don't use them. Remember that. So, the protector imperatives are all about shooting. So the first one is called hazard optimization. It's the gamma imperative. These, these alpha, beta, gamma mean nothing. They just show the power of the imperative. So, if you use this one until the start of your next turn, all models in friendly units with doctrine imperatives add one to their ballistic skill. This is pretty good. Uh, Skitari shooting is pretty good to begin with, um, but their units are quite small and they need to make the shots count. And they have a few single shot weapons as well, so going to Ballistic Skill 5 will make that more likely. And there is also the bonus that it has no penalties as well. Uh, the Beta and Alpha ones um, are a bit punishing in other ways, so sometimes you don't want to use them. Hazard optimization, you don't have to worry about it. The turns you want to be using this are the turns where you're about to hit melee, um, because you really don't want to be losing your weapon skill, as the uh, beta and alpha ones do, uh, for gain and ballistic skill, because you might get stuck in melee. Your weapon skill is not great to begin with, I think it's three or four, so you don't want to be dropping it unless you're guaranteed to be out of melee. The beta imperative is Gundril Symbiosis, or Symbiosis, depends on who you ask. Uh, until the start of your next turn, all models in friendly units with Doctrina Imperatives add 2 to their ballistic skills. They become ballistic skill 5, ballistic skill 6. Um, I think it's 5 and 6. I'll just check there's nothing that's um, better or worse than that. So BS4, 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 BS4. Yeah, everything becomes ballistic skill 6, basically. Uh, I thought there were a few things with different ballistic skills. But... Your weapon skill goes down by one to either two or three. I don't think there's anything that's weapon skill five. And this is this is fine because it means you get a reroll if you miss. Admittedly, you only heal a six. But minus one weapon skill is quite punishing if you're about to go into a melee with anything that's weapon skill five. Uh, yes, they're hitting on threes, but you'll be hitting on fives with weapon skill two units. And the things that are weapon skill four are particularly punishing because they will now actually hit you on threes. Or if they're weapon skill three, they'll now hit you on fours with your best units and threes with your worst units. This is bad, 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 and you really want to try and avoid this. This one is to be used probably on about turn two, uh, maybe turn three, depending on how close you and your opponent are to each other, where you know you're almost guaranteed not to hit melee because everything pretty much has Doctrina Imperatives. The final one is the Alpha Imperative, Binharic Omniscience. I feel like that shouldn't be a H, that should be binary, but whatever. Uh, yeah, it should be binary, I think. Anyway, until the start of your next turn, on models in friendly units with Doctrina Imperatives add three to their ballistic skill. 
foot lose two weapon skill. You do not use this if any of your units is about to go anywhere near melee at all. You cannot be weapon skill one or two because anything that's weapon skill five, you can't hurt. Anything that's weapon skill four, well, some things you can't actually hurt them on fours. It's really, really bad. So you have to be using this when you know you're not going to go into melee. This may mean you never use it. Against Alpha Strike based armies, it can be quite scary if they drop a lot of stuff up close or they're playing a very fast list. You may never get to use this. But that's okay because the difference between Ballistic Skill 7 and Ballistic Skill 6 is far less marks than the difference between Ballistic Skill 5 and Ballistic Skill 4, or even between 6 and 5. Because 5, ver five up versus 6 up compared to 3 up versus 4 up, or 2 up versus 3 up. The difference is, it just feels more noticeable, I think. So, I wouldn't worry if you don't end up using it, because you don't have to use a Doctrina every turn. Um, so, if you don't want to use Binary Cognitions, I understand. Then we have the Conqueror Imperatives. These are all about getting up close and personal. Mind State Secutor is your Gamma. Until the start of your next turn, all models with the Doctrina Imperatives in friendly units add one to their weapon skill. Again, this is non-punishing to your Ballistic skill. This means that you can use this when roughly half of your army is in melee, but you still want to get a lot of shooting in. You don't want to, uh, you need the weapon skill buff, let's say, so you can hit on threes, um, but you don't need to, you don't want to lose any shooting power. So putting this one on is kind of handy. Technomata Concords, that's your beta. Uh, until the start of your next turn, all models in front of the user shooting imperatives add two to their weapon skill, but have minus one ballistic skill. This is one to be used just after you've hit melee. This is the one to be used the turn after your opponent charges you, or the turn after you've had a round of combat. You don't want to use this on the turn you charge. You'd rather have a, a plus one weapon skill, because you still want your guns to be firing on all cylinders, unless they're flamers or blast tank weapons, so it's kind of negligible. Um, so I will put this one on the turn after your opponent has charged you on mass. You don't have that many guns left, but you don't want to punish them too hard, but you still need the weapon skill buff to take you up to weapon skill 5 or 6, where you'll do pretty well at hitting things. Finally, we have Hyper Action Protocol, which is your alpha. Until the start of your next turn, you get plus 3 weapon skill, but minus 2 ballistic skill. This you really have to use when your entire army is in melee, pretty much. Unless the things that aren't in melee are packing things like flamers, particularly they're packing pistols, because they're going down to like ballistic skill 2. Uh, you don't really want to be putting this on, but it's far less punishing with this one, I think, than it is on the shooting one. Because, as I said, the difference between weapons, the Ballistic Skill 7 and Ballistic Skill 6 is kind of negligible. The difference between Weapons Skill 6 and Weapons Skill 5, actually, yeah, is still kind of negligible. You have got units that are Weapons Skill 4. The difference between Weapons Skill 7 and 6 is massive, because there's a lot of Weapons Skill 3 guys out there who will now hit you on 5s. Uh, you do go to BS2, which is a downside, but if you have flamers, if you have blast weapons, you can negate this. But this is still one to be used when most, if not all, of your army is now engaged in melee. And that's not true in Imperators. They're good. Um, I think the Gammas you'll use the most. You only get one per game, though. So remembering when to put this on, and actually remembering to put it on, is rather important. It's all about practice and getting used to when you need it. I think the plus ones are used to be used in between melee and combat turns. The beta ones are to be used either just before you hit melee and just after. And the plus threes uh, are probably used either when your entire army is in or your entire army is safe from being in. All right, moving on. Other special rules for the Skitari is Dune Strider. A unit with this special rule adds three inches to its maximum move distance when it moves in the movement phase and when it runs and when it charges. This means that, assuming you don't have run and charge, which you don't, uh, you have a theoretical, I, I say theoretical, 24-inch hit range, because you have plus 6 inches to your total move and charge. This can be quite scary for an opponent who's never faced Guitari before, because all of a sudden, oh, this guy's 18 inches away. I don't have to worry about that. Oh, he just moved 9. And he's charging 2d6 plus 3? What? It, it can be quite scary if you're not ready for it. There are some units in here that would probably do well getting a charge off. So having that power is pretty handy. It's also good for getting you out of range. Let's say you're being chased down and you're carrying an objective by another infantry unit. Say that's not bikes. You can now outrun them, which is pretty handy. 
Uh, in terms of your allies, you are a Skitari faction, of course, and you're an Imperial army, so just follow the Imperial allies matrix. That's kind of obvious. Uh, right, Warlord traits. Now, Warlord traits for Skitari are a bit funky. So, when generating his Warlord trait, a Skitari Warlord can either roll a d6 on one of the Warlord trait tables in 40k, the rules, obviously, or roll a d3 on the table I'm about to read to you. If your Warlord, however, is a Skitari Vanguard Alpha or Ranger Alpha, so a basic troop sergeant, you can roll a d6 on a Warlord trait table in 40k rules, or roll a d6 on the table below. So, uh, there are a couple of units that aren't Vanguard and Ranger, they only roll a d3, and then the Rangers and Vanguard Alphas can roll a d6. All of them can always roll a d6 on the 40k tables. So, I think this is trying to incentivize you to make Ranger and Vanguard Alphas your Warlords, and generally I would recommend you do that, because they're the safest models in the unit, in, in the year army, because they're in larger units. Right, so let's look at the Skitari Warlord Traits table. Let's look at the first three. These are what I says to all of your Warlords. Number one, Reinforced Exoskeleton. You get Eternal Warrior. This is all right. Your Warlords do have two wounds, but they generally have an all right, uh, and kind of average save, low toughness, and a feel no pain roll of six up in the case of um, Ranger and Vanguard Alphas, five up in the case of the more elite infantry. Um, so it's all right, but I wouldn't call it stellar. That's for sure. Number two, Artificer Armament. Uh, nominate one weapon carried by your Warlord, and that weapon now becomes Master Crafted. However, this cannot be applied to Relics. This is alright, I mean, you may have some good combat weapons. Uh, I'll just have a look and see if there's any particularly special weapons that I can think of that would really get some use out of this. Uh, the Arc Weapons, which are quite a uh, single shot, but quite powerful, you can get them to hit. Cognis Weapons, although I don't think um, you can use those. Uh, eradication Beamer, don't know if you'll be able to use that. Um, Galvanic Rifle is rapid fire, that's okay. Icarus Array, that won't be on your Warlord guys. That's um, a Blast Weapon. The pistols, like the Phosphor Weapons, they could be quite good with it. Um, what about Melee Weapons? What about Melee Weapons? You've got your... Um, Haywire Power Mall, that could be good with Master Crafted. Um, power Sword, never hurt. The Taser Weapons, yeah, I think the Taser Weapons would be quite handy with it. Uh, the Transonic Weapons um, could be useful, but I don't know. Uh, so yeah, it's not too bad to have Master Crafted. It's, it's, not a, it's never a bad thing, but there could be better. And then number three, Masterwork Bionics. This gives you re-rolls to your Feel No Pain rolls. This is pretty good. I mean, uh, the more elite guys have 5 up Feel No Pain, so re-rollable 5 up Feel No Pain is pretty handy. Although on your Ranger of Vanguard Alphas, it's just a re-rollable 6 up. And take it from an Orc player, re-rollable 6 up to nothing special. Um, so these are your ones available to all your Warlords. They're kind of meh. They're, they're not bad, per se, but they could be better. So if you do pick a Ranger or a Vanguard Alpha as your Warlord, you also get these three as your options. Number four, the Incense Generatorum. Uh, you get Shrouded. This means stand in some cover, you have a three-up cover save, which is insanely good. Um, just be wary, Nor's cover will ruin your day. But it's still damn good. Number five, Disciple of the Omnissiah. The Warlord and all friendly units with the Skitari faction in 12 inches, reroll, fail morale, pinning, and fear checks. This is pretty good. I mean, your leadership is quite high. Uh, all your Alphas are leadership nine, and your normal guys are leadership eight. So... Rerolling failed checks within 12 inches, pretty good. Although, being a Ranger or Vanguard Alpha, you might not be in the thick of things all the time. The Vanguard get quite close, but the Rangers don't. And then six, Emotionless Clarity. Uh, when your Warlord and his unit fire Overwatch, their ballistic skill is counted as being four instead of one. Note, this is not affected by bonuses or penalties from Doctrine Imperatives. So if you've buffed your army's weapon skill by three, you'll still ballistic skill four on Overwatch, you'll not be S7. Um, and if you've taken the minus penalties for your weapon skill, again, you're not penalized for that. Uh, this is really quite nice, but you should bear in mind that most of your weapons are not ridiculous, and most of your guys and your units top out at 10. Um, he does say that his units, so if you do have attached characters with very big scary guns, um, such as, I don't know, I'm trying to think of one. Maybe Dawn's Arrow from Pedro Cantor, if he's allied in, which is four-shot Stormbolter. That now goes to ballistic skill four instead of one. 
Um, there are some useful things you can do because it only says it says it's him and his unit, but if a character's in the unit, does that affect the character? Not sure, but need clarification on that one. But the warlord traits, they're all right. Um, the best ones probably we will feel no pain if you're not a warlord, who's a vanguard or ranger. Uh, shrouded is good. Uh, emotionless clarity is probably good. Decided the Messiah is all right. <coughs> the other two, I'll take or leave. Um, so definitely the incentive is on you to make a range of vanguard alpha your warlords. Right, now let's go look at the relics. We've just had them mentioned briefly, and now is a good time to go and look at them. Where are they? Here they are. So the first one, okay, let me just uh, check this. Um, one uh, per army, as usual, it's a relic. The first one is called Arkans Divinator. If the bearer of Arkans Divinator or any model in his unit identifies a mysterious objective or deploys or moves into a piece of mysterious terrain, you can choose to re-roll the result when determining what it is. This is so bad. We, don't, I mean, this could just be our gaming group, but we don't play mysterious objectives or mysterious terrain because they're just irrelevant a lot of the time. Although in a tournament setting, I can see this being pretty useful. Uh, getting re-rolls, um, say, to get the Scatterfield, to get the Skyfire Nexus on a unit with a Cognis Lance Cannon or with a um, Archivus Armorbane Sniper, I suppose it has a little bit of value. Although it is pretty bad, I think. But saying that, it will only set you back. Where's the war gear list? Here we go. It will only set you back five points. So it could be a lot, lot worse. The next one we have is the Phase Taser. This is a melee weapon, and it replaces your melee weapon if you have one. Uh, it costs 15 points. Now, taser weapons um, are a bit more generic to Skitari. I don't know if they're in Mechanicus. They're kind of like reverse Tesla. So let's talk about it. Uh, it is a melee weapon with plus two strength, taser, and interdimensional electrocution. Uh, which means that if any model that suffers one or more unsaved wounds from this weapon that has this rule must immediately take an initiative test and pass it or die. So this is good at taking out um, very nasty, low initiative guys. So guys like Necron Overlords who have initiative like two or Guard HQs who have like initiative three or four. It won't help for crap against some things. But one of the other things you can use with this is monstrous creatures. Your strength is five uh, in the most cases. Uh, it could be six. Um, and it gives you the option to go after monsters. If they fail an armor save, things like um, Carnifexes particularly have a low initiative. So killing them is pretty useful. Uh, in terms of the taser rule, uh, what that does, if I just find the melee weapons list. Taser, 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 taser. Here we go. Um, when making an attack with a weapon that has this special rule, it's a hit roll of a six causes two additional hits on the target. It, like I say, it's like reverse Tesla. So instead of a six to hit shooting, it's a six to hit in melee. Uh, and it's pretty good, um, which means that your guys, if they do go into melee with, say, a monster or a character, can really pile on the amount of hits they're causing, therefore basically double their wound output, giving them twice as much chance to cause the initiative test and then potentially kill that character. It's all right. It's 15 points. Um, and would I pay that over a power weapon? Probably. I, it depends on the army I'm facing, but I'd probably pay for that over a power weapon quite often because it's pretty handy. The next one is called the Omniscient Mask. Simply, this gives you Zealot. Um, zealot being fearless and hatred. Uh, this is all right. I mean, your leadership is not that low. Um, I think the hatred is all right as well, but it's not that good. And it will set you back 20 points. OK, that's too much. That's too many points, I think, to get away with affording that. Sorry. The next one is called the Pater Radium. Uh, I'm assuming that's far, sort of like the original radioactive weapon that the Skitari had access to. And what it is, is if the bearer of the Pater Radium is locked in combat with one or more enemy units at the end of the initiative one step, so while the combat is still ongoing, so before combat res, each enemy unit locked in combat with the bearer uh, must take a toughness test using the toughness value of the majority of the unit. Uh, or the highest in the case of a tie, as you usually do. Um, if the test is failed, the unit takes D6 randomly allocated wounds with no armor saves. That's pretty good. That is pretty good, I have to say. 
Um, the big issue here is keeping the bearer alive. If it's a Vanguard or Ranger Alpha, they don't want to be getting that stuck into melee. And they might have two wounds, but it's it's risky. You need to keep your bearer alive for this to work. And with small units of 10, that's a little bit dangerous. But if it does work, it's really good at sniping out Eldar Aspect Warriors who have good saves but bad toughness. Um, some guard units, perhaps, like Veterans and Carapace Armor, would be quite good to get rid of. Uh, it's nasty against... Um, Space Marine Terminators, because you have a two a one-third chance to deal D6 wounds. I mean, they get their involves, but that's still pretty good. It's the same with Orc Meganos, but you have a 50-50 chance to kill, basic to deal D6 wounds, which is, like, kill D3 guys, or not, not kill D3 guys, but it's, it is rather nasty. Um, and I still think the issue is keeping your guy alive. I think I mentioned his points cost. I think it was 20 points. Um... So I think it's worth taking, but it's a little bit difficult. Right. The next one we're going to talk about is the Foss Phoenix. It's a gun. It's a six inch range, strength five, AP two pistol with poison three plus and Phosphex. When firing a weapon with a special roll, a successful to hit roll scores three hits instead of one. This is something you need Doctrine Imperatives for. Because you can't afford to miss with this guy. I mean, this thing has a terrible, terrible, terrible range. Six inches is appalling. So you have to get up close and personal. And then if you're going to get that close, you can't afford to miss. So putting Doctrine is on when you're about to use this. But then the problem is your weapon skill. So you definitely need to be buffing your BS to five when you're firing this thing. Just to make sure you hit. Um, because if you get three hits that basically kill whatever they hit on threes... That's pretty damn good. It also has the Luminogen rule, which is another rule you need for this codex. And what it does is any unit that suffers one or more unsaved wounds, glances, or pens from this weapon uh, counts its cover saves as being one point worse than normal until end of phase. Furthermore, units can reroll dice to determine their charge range against this unit until the end of the turn. See what I mean about you need to hit? Because if this thing hits and then wounds, which it should, and then kills something, or just causes an unsaved wound, which it 99% of the time will, then that unit's cover save has just gone down by one. Which means if they were camping behind another unit, it means that they now have a six up cover. If they were sort of, if they'd gone to ground, they've now lost that cover. Um, it won't help you with the original Luminogen shot, um, but you may have gotten to a position where you're, they're not getting a cover save from you, but they are getting a cover save from everything else. And you can also reroll the charge dice. So if you are then going to throw this unit in, let's say it's a unit of Rust Stalkers or Infiltrators, then you're just more likely to get the charge off. Though you'll be within six inches of this gun, it's fired anyway. That gun is all right. I think it's pretty good. Its range is crippling, though. So let's go and have a look at what it costs. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Foss Phoenix. 25 points? 25 points? No. Oh, and you can't even take it if you're a Rust Stalker, which is probably one of the best units to use it, because they're close-up and personal type of dudes. But then again, I don't think they have a gun, because it replaces your ranged weapon. Uh, so, yeah, that's bad. 25 points is... I think that's just too many points um, for, a, for a bad plasma pistol. I mean, it doesn't get hard. It has three shots if it hits, but it's half the range. It can't hurt vehicles, really, because it's strength five. And the Luminogen rule is debatably average. 25 points, you cost too much. Finally, we have the Skull of Elder Nikola. Uh, spell exactly the same as Nikola Tesla, so I suspect an electrical theme here. Let's have a look. Uh, once per game, the bearer of the Skull can unleash its power instead of shooting. So you don't want to be doing this with anyone who's got a really big gun. To do so, roll a number of d6 equal to the turn number. So if it's turn 3, you roll 3d6. If it's turn 5, you roll 5d6. And the total rolled is the range of the attack in inches. All enemy vehicles within this range, so it's a big, big bubble effect. So if it's a strength one, AP nothing, haywire hit. Okay. That's all. That, 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 hmm. I don't know what to make of that. I mean, against some armies, it's completely dead because they have no vehicles. Um, against some armies, it's particularly good. So against guard, if you can get infiltrators up close and then just pop the skull and just zap all of their vehicles, knock a hull point off, it's pretty good. Uh, but some things it's just not good at all. Um, the best time to be using this is probably turn three or four, 
Uh, turn two is too short a range, there's too high a risk of you just rolling really badly. Turn three, you're probably going to average about a 10, giving you a 20 inch range diameter bubble, which should hit quite a few vehicles. Turn four, you're averaging 14, giving you basically almost half the width. Say again. All right, I'll be down in five. Um, so yeah, pretty good for that. Uh, turn four is probably the best time to use it, but turn three will work as well. Um, but I do think it's a little bit overcosted. I mean, 25 points. Okay, let's let's look at it this way. For 25 points, once per game, deal a glancing hit to all vehicles, all enemy vehicles within 12 inches, let's say. Would you pay 25 points to deal a glancing hit once per game to all vehicles within 12 inches? That's the question you've got to ask yourself with this thing, because that's the best you're going to get, really. Um, of course, it depends on your opponent, and it depends on how, what type of army they run, and whether it's mechanized, whether it's infantry-based. But I think the skull has a small amount of value. Let's wrap it up now, because there's a game of football I want to go and watch um, with the detachment, the Skitari Manable. Yeah, that's what it's called. So, you have compulsory two troops. Uh, that's all, which are your ranger and vanguard squads. You then have the option to take six troops, extra, four elites, two fast attack, four heavy support, a fortification, and that's it. You have no HQs and no Lords of War because they don't exist in this codex. Okay? Um, this is pretty good because it gives you a lot of access to the Rust Stalkers, it gives you a lot of access to the Dune Crawlers, and the, but it gives you limited access to Sidonian Dragoons who are also walkers. So you're going to be playing quite a slow game regardless. Uh, it's not bad, and you do get a fortification. Uh, all units in this detachment must be Skitari or have no faction, so no sneaking in a Mechanicus heavy support choice here. Sorry. Uh, but you can still get like a Bastion, Aegis Defense Line, Fortress of Redemption or something. And for command benefits, Crux Mechanicus. If this is your primary detachment, you can re-roll the result when rolling on the Warlord traits table in Codex Skitari. Furthermore, your Warlord has preferred enemy. Uh, preferred enemy is pretty good, um, particularly on Doctrina turns where you can buff your ballistic skill to make sure you hit, and you have some high strength weapons as well. Does preferred enemy carry over to your unit? I feel like it does. I could be wrong though. Uh, oh well, uh, it's still not too bad, and it allows you, if you're a ranger or vanguard, to make sure you get those top three, which are much better. And then finally, tireless advance. All whilst in this detachment have crusader and scout, but they can't outflank. Because Scout gives you outflank, um, it, that's how I used to use my Death Copters, um, but you can't outflank because of this Scout, you just get the free move. This is debatably good, because the free moves, your guns are not that long range, you have some long range guns and some short range guns, um, but mostly short range. So getting a free move forward is not too bad, but it does mean you're a bit closer to getting smashed in the face if you want to put your Ballistic Skill buffing Doctrinas on. Sketchy. Uh, Crusader, I think, is, was a buff to sweeping advance movements or consolidations or something. I'm pre I, I can't remember. It was mentioned in the Militarum Tempestus analysis. I'll go and have a look and I'll try and clarify it in the next episode. Uh, overall, this detachment is pretty good, uh, but you're limited in the number of units you actually have access to. So we, we will do all seven of them in the next video. In the meantime, I do hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to leave a like if you did and leave any comments about Skitari down below in the comments. I'd be very interested to read what you have to say. As I say, next episode, we'll do all the units and the episode after we'll do the formations. Until next time, my name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis and I'll see you all again, folks. Bye for now.